Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Glad you're here. My name is Jerry Dotry, the Dean of the Mario J. Gabelli School of Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our Leadership Institute's Distinguished Leader uh, presentation. We are very glad you're here. First, an announcement before I forget it, because always, I've always wanted to make this kind of announcement. Please turn off your cell phones. Uh, this is being uh, taped by C-SPAN. It is being, uh, we have a live feed going over to the uh, library for the overflow. So I ask that you do turn off your cell phones and um, uh, bear with us on that. I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And uh, our president, uh, uh, President Farish is here along with the vice presidents. We're also joined uh, by a special guest, uh, Mario Gabelli, who is, um, uh, of course, the namesake of our School of Business, but also he was our distinguished leader speaker in 2011. So it's great that Mario was able to join us today to honor his friend, Lee Cooperman. So. Mr. Gabelli and Mr. Cooperman go back a long way uh, to the days of Columbia Business School 45 years ago. So we're very glad that uh, Mario, who was our speaker last year at this event, is here to uh, help us welcome Lee Cooperman to campus. Um, Mr. Cooperman's leadership in the financial world uh, is uh, without uh, uh, peer, really. I mean, I, I do know that he kind of doesn't like the term legend, but he and Mario Gabelli are legends in the uh, uh, field of finance. I heard it on CNBC, so I know it must be true. Uh, there, we have two legends here, and we're very proud of that. Uh, he spent 25 years at Goldman Sachs and retired from his position as chairman and chief executive officer of Goldman Sachs Asset Management in order to organize his own private investment partnership, Omega Advisors, a hedge fund. Uh, Mr. Koopman's, you know, devoted 45 years to the investment industry financial industry. He's a senior member and past president of the New York Society of Security Analysts. He doesn't, he said earlier at the meeting today, he doesn't particularly like talking about himself, but he, he, he really needs to because he has a really incredible career. And also, I, I want to point out that not only is he a leader in the world of finance, he's also a leader in the world of philanthropy. Uh, he is, um, uh, I, I was reading an article from the Wall Street Journal about him, and it was entitled, Giving Others a Chance at the American Dream. And I thought that really struck a, a chord with me, because he talked in that article about he feels that he lived the American Dream, and he has devoted a good part of his life to giving others the opportunity to uh, pursue the American Dream. He, is, he and his wife are signatories of the Giving Pledge, a public commitment uh, started by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates that commits uh, billionaires to give away a majority of their wealth to charity. He's taken a lead in that. He's a longtime donor to the Columbia Business School. He's a recipient of the American Jewish Committee Humanitarian Award, the Seton Hall Humanitarian of the Year Award, the Boys and Cl uh, Girls Club of uh, Newark uh, Award for Caring. Again, he's just, you know, uh, a real leader in both fields. He has a bachelor's degree from Hunter College, an MBA from Columbia Business School, and importantly, an honorary doctorate from Roger Williams University. So it's my pleasure to welcome Lee Cooperman to this one. I think better without the jacket. So. I thank you very much for that gracious introduction. I kind of, when I hear introductions like that, I think I've got to keep in reserve for my obituary. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here, particularly since I was asked by one of my great friends, Mario Gabelli, and Mario asks, you deliver? Because I know when I ask Mario, he delivers, and that's the essence of a good friendship. Um, I've found over the years that sessions like these are uh, as valuable to you as the quality of your questions. So um, as you see when I develop uh, some information about my background, uh, a lot of different areas we could touch on, I'm gonna leave it to you. Uh, don't hold back, I'm very open, uh, 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 no secrets, so I'll be happy to respond to any areas that you would like me to develop uh, more thoughts on. As the cover sheet shows, that I'm gonna talk a little bit about life, uh, hedge funds, and the investment outlook. Uh, I think probably the most important thing I could talk about is life because you know, I've spent uh, 45 plus years in the business world, and uh, 
uh, at the age of 69 and being an investor for about 45 years, uh, I am entitled to be a bit of a philosopher. So uh, given my diverse background, I can respond to your questions from a number of vantage points. Uh, first, I'm a poor kid out of the South Bronx and uh, that became successful so I could uh, speak to the issue of being uh, poor and being rich and that's an easy one, rich is better. Uh, <laughs> second, uh, I've been a sell-side uh, research analyst a sell-side uh, portfolio strategist, I call them pontificators, and a chief investment officer of a major money management organization uh, for the past 20 years. So I could speak to being in the brokerage business, selling research services to uh, people on the buy side, and then I could speak to being on the buy side where I am presently. Uh, thirdly, I was a director, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and chairman of the audit committee of uh, automatic data processing for 20 years, so I can speak to issues of uh, corporate governance, um, and Starbucks, Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, and uh, lastly, I've had a uh, large number of, philosoph of philanthropic involvements, so I, so I could speak to a view towards uh, philanthropy. Uh, and really, it's been a great trip for me uh, from humble beginnings in the South Bronx. My dad, may rest in peace, was a plumber in the South Bronx to where I stand here today. Uh, very similar. I got an edge over Mario in this humble category because I was a first generation born in America Mario technically was the second generation, but his, uh, I guess his uh, grandfather died in the coal mine in the late 19, uh, 1890s, I believe, and your dad went back to Italy, and, and then, uh, uh, but was born in America. So, but Mario is equally success and deserves all his success. But I, I think in describing my trip from the South Bronx to here I, should be an inspiration to all of you, because I say this with a great uh, sincerity, that uh, with an average IQ, a strong work ethic and a heavy dose of good luck, you can go very far. I started my journey uh, going to public school, 75 in the South Bronx. I then went to Morris High School in the South Bronx. And then I graduated to the West Bronx. I went to Hunter College, uh, City University of New York, now called Lehman College. Uh, I spent four very happy years there. I met my wife of 48 years in our French class in our sophomore year. And uh, given my uh, skills at language, I would probably still be at Hunter if it wasn't my wife helping me in French. Uh, I've always had a problem with languages, and after this presentation, you'll see you probably have a problem with English. Um, upon graduating from Hunter, I worked for about 18 months for Xerox Corporation up in Rochester, New York. Uh, and then I returned to uh, New York uh, to Columbia Business School, where I got an MBA, um, uh, uh, and that opened the door to Wall Street. So you know, my first observation is, uh, whether it's right or wrong, uh, getting that advanced degree is what uh, improved my credentials, opened the door to Wall Street. I'm sure Goldman Sachs uh, is stuffy enough probably not to recruit necessarily at the undergraduate level. And so that MBA uh, opened the door to Goldman Sachs for me. Uh, I myself prefer uh, PhDs working for me, but that would stand for poor, hungry, and driven. Uh, because I did not learn my drive from Columbia or Hunter, something innate, I guess you learn from your parents. Uh, ever since it was introduced to the marketplace, I have used, and this is true, I used it this morning, the men's cologne called uh, Obsession by Calvin Klein. And frankly, that is the word I would describe, uh, my, to, uh, would use to describe my approach to the business. Not only is investing my vocation, meaning that's where I earn my living, but it's uh, my advocation and investing to me has proven as a means of supplementing my income. So uh, it's uh, all consuming. And uh, a shorthand translation in my case would be the harder I worked, the luckier I got. Uh, and uh, I would say that hard work has never killed anybody. And I think to be successful in your uh, chosen field of endeavor, be prepared to give of your mind, your, your body, your soul to uh, achieve that success. Uh, I show the people that work for me this slide. Uh, for those of you that back to me have trouble seeing it, it's a simple slide. Uh, uh, makes a lot of sense, right? Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up and knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. And every morning a lion wakes up and knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or will starve to death. And it doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle, when the sun comes up, you better be running. And it may sound humorous to you, but I tell my people there's a message there. And in my industry, uh, basically, roughly speaking, if you allow me to round off, there are 10,000 mutual funds 
many of which are very competently managed, that will manage your money for less than 1% 1, 1 or less, let's say. And there are roughly 10,000 hedge funds that request some variation of either a 1% or 2% margin fee and 20% of the profits as their remuneration. So assuming for the moment uh, uh, your clients are not mullets, meaning fools, and our clients aren't, we have some of the most sophisticated clients that uh, have money with us, uh, if they're gonna pay you some variation of two and 20 and can get the exact same performance pre-fee from a 1% manager, there's no reason they're gonna be investing with you. So if your client comes with you, basically they're coming with you because basically they think you'll outperform. That when the market's doing well, you figure out what to do and you'll make more. Uh, and when the market's underperforming in a defensive mode, you'll figure out what to do and get hedged and get defensively postured. So uh, what I say when I look at this slide and I tell my people this is, you know, you're always gotta be on the balls of your feet, no resting on your laurels. Uh, if you wanna get paid more, you gotta produce more. And simple as that. And if you're not prepared to give it the body and the mind, you're probably in the wrong business. Now, these are some of the elements of philosophy that I have. I think they're the right philosophy, and I think uh, I want to share them with you because it took me 45 years to develop this philosophy. I see a lot of young, nice faces in the audience, so I want to impart this philosophy to you early on in your careers. So uh, Andrew Carnegie uh, said uh, around 1900, I wish to have as my epitaph, here lies a man, and I would insert in today's age, or woman, who was wise enough to bring into his service men or women who knew more than he. Okay, and so one of the great secrets to success, in my opinion, is to, to surround yourself with the most able, capable people, and don't be threatened by them, but be benefited by that. And over my career, I have been very fortunate to have in my service uh, men and women that made me better than I was and I was able to hold on to them because I properly shared the fruits of our labors with them. I created the business, I raised the money, uh, but I understand the importance of having quality people at your side, and so I properly share uh, um, you know, the uh, benefits of my business with people uh, that uh, work with me. My personal philosophy of life, uh, I summed up about, uh, I guess it's now uh, four years ago when I took uh, my entire family at that time uh, had uh, have two sons, 46, 43. They were a little bit younger four years ago. Uh, my two daughter-in-laws, my, at that time, uh, two grandchildren. Now I'm lucky enough to have three, but three and done. I like them so much, I like to have more, but I, I can't control that. But I took them all away for an all-expenses-paid vacation uh, 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 to a hotel, and I explained to them uh, that statistically, a male that survives at age 65 will on average live to 82. So the good news, if I'm average, uh, I have about 13 years left. That's not a very comforting number, I might add. Uh, um, and the bad news is I really live 75% of my life largely in front of compu computer terminals investing. But I gave them four observations that, uh, about life that I would give to you. And that is number one, there is nothing more important than family. Uh, they root for you and care about you the most, so stay close to your family under all circumstances. Second, and I, I really consider Mary one of my great friends, but I say to have, to, to, it's great to have friends, but to have friends, you, know, you have to know how to be a friend. So be trusting, friendly, and supportive of your friends. Extend yourself whenever you can. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, the only way to have a friend is to be one. And I think that's very important in life. Third, uh, I told my kids, uh, never do anything in life that if what you did appeared on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, that you would be embarrassed. Uh, live your life as an open book, uh, uh, and, and that's the best way to conduct yourself. And finally, which is gonna seem very remote to the vast majority of in the audience, is uh, because it's far down the road, when you have achieved financial security and success, share with others less fortunate than yourself. Because in a biblical sense, we are our brother's keeper. Uh, and I think we have a moral obligation to help others in need. And so, you know, over the years, I've read a lot of words of other people that uh, have struck me in a, in a manner that uh, impressed me better than uh, words that I could make up. So I've used the words of others. So uh, William Lynn Felt, I don't know any of these people, by the way. I knew Henry Ford, I knew who he was, but I don't know the other people. <laughs> the first test of a gentleman, his respect for those that could be of no possible value to him. Let me explain. I've seen over the years people that uh, treat very nicely people in a superior position to them, 
but are nasty to people below them. There could be absolutely no value to them, is what Phelps had to say. And I really detest that kind of behavior. So in my view, conduct yourself in a manner, respect people, no matter what they could do for you, whether above you in life or below you, but treat people with respect and dignity, and I think they'll come back and basically uh, reward you in many ways. Um, Henry Ford said uh, uh, the best way to make money in a business is not to think too much about making it. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett, who's more of a, a contemporary, one uh, Mario and I have great respect for, he says, you know, go to work with people you respect and admire, tap dance to work, don't worry about the money, everything else will take care of itself. And, uh, you know, we're all economic people to a degree, but I think it's a very good advice, uh, because you're not going to really do well at something you don't like. So find something you like, uh, do it with people you respect and admire, and hopefully the rest will take care of itself. Uh, I'll skip the Chinese proverb, but it's worth uh, reading. But uh, uh, William Ward, I tried to Google him, and I found out there were about 15 William Wards on Google. I don't know which one, but I, I thought his words were uh, uh, really very succinct and something I believe in. You know, before you speak, listen. Before you write, think. Before you spend, earn. Before you invest, investigate. I do that most of the time. Before you criticize, wait. You know, words hurt. Before you pray, forgive. Before you quit, try before you retire, save, and before you die, give. And uh, I think that's a very good uh, sequence uh, uh, of advice. Now, I have a granddaughter, believe it or not, who's uh, 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 very poetic and uh, um, very into the nonprofit world. She just turned 14. Uh, she's been writing poetry since the age of seven. She just came back uh, from two weeks in uh, Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, on a, uh, uh, a uh, educational two weeks for a charitable giving and charitable involvement in the communities. And uh, my family is Jewish, and he said, if I'm, this is Rabbi Hillel, famous rabbi, he said, if I'm not for myself, then who will be for me? If I'm not for others, then what I, am I? Am I, am I? If I'm not now, when? And my uh, granddaughter is Courtney, and these were her answers. And I believe in them. If you're not for others, no one will be for you. If you are for others, then others will be for you. You show others how to be for more than only themselves, and they will therefore be for you. The time is always now. So, now or never. So, uh, I would say the relevancy to you, because you know, giving is probably not something you can afford to do now financially. You are in a very, very competitive world today. And one of the things you should do to, hopefully you want to do out of your own initiative, but at a minimum, to improve your resumes and your competitiveness in the, in the world is try to find community activities that you can give back to to distinguish your resume from the next person. Because people like me are getting resumes in every day in this difficult economic environment from Phi Bates and from uh, you know, high class standing people with uh, 800 SATs that are looking for a job. And what you gotta do is find a hook on your resume and to the extent you show a high sense of community service and involvement on top of good grades, that may be something, a way of distinguishing yourself from the rest. Now, also, you want to go into a field that you have an aptitude for. As I said, that you're not going to succeed at something unless you have an aptitude. So I thought I would put together a list of characteristics I look for uh, when I interview people. And I'm sure Mario can add to this list as well. But basically, you know, a desire and commitment to be the best, a strong work ethic. You know, here I am, you know, <laughs> the introducers as a legend, and I keep saying to myself, you know, a legend does not have an alarm clock that goes over 5.15 in the morning to drive to Jersey City to take a 629 boat around the tip of Manhattan to be in his office at 6.45 every morning and go out every night of the week with companies or other money managers to try and figure out ways of beating the market. You know, that's, you know, legends do something different. But, um, you know, these are some of the characteristics I look for. This, by the way, uh, slide deck is available to you in hard copy. And to the extent you want them through the administration of the university, uh, you can get them. Uh, um, but uh, if numbers don't speak to you, in other words, uh, you know, Ben Graham uh, wrote a book called The Intelligent Investor in 1954. And in the book, he hypothesized that uh, analysts evaluate management twice in the process. Uh, once through the numbers. In other words, when you look at a company, the company's growing at X, and return on investment is Y, and profit margins or whatever, and uh, return on capital, whatever. Those are financial statistics resulting from the efforts of management. 
So uh, uh, you want to look at the financials, but also you want to look at the management face to face and try to assess uh, whether they understand their business properly, whether they have the right moral compass, whether the people you want to invest in and bet on. So I, I think if you don't like working with numbers and you don't like working with people, uh, my guess is the area of security analysis uh, might not be that appealing to you. If you like working with numbers, that would be something then that would be uh, important. I found a tremendous amount of interest in the hedge fund industry uh, over the last uh, five or six years, but I want you to know it's not a one-way street. So what I arrayed, this was an article written in Fortune magazine in 1900 and I think 70 or 71 by a very, very distinguished writer. Her name is Carol Loomis. She actually writes a lot of the annual report stuff for Warren Buffett. And she couldn't have been more wrong because this article was written to ring the death knoll for the hedge fund industry after the 68, 70 bear market. And as you look at that, uh, other than uh, a mutual friend of Mario and I, Michael Steinhardt, everyone got pretty severely beat up, okay? But uh, today, I could name 50 hedge funds that are over $10 billion. So the argument that the industry was over uh, was totally wrong. You know, and that what is most striking to me, the largest hedge fund in 1968 was 220 million dollars. Startups are starting up with billions of dollars today. So it's a, it's a cyclical growth industry, uh, and if you produce the returns, you'll grow, and if you don't, you'll atrophy. It's a little bit like Darwinism, right? Survival of the fittest. But uh, so don't think if you go into the business that it's just up, 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 and no hiccups along the way. Every business has hiccups along the way, and what separates the men from the boys is how you do in periods of adversity and how you deal with it. In the last 20 years, I've had three years where I've had losses my investors, uh, difficult, it's hard to pay your people, uh, you lose a certain amount of self-esteem because you got the environment wrong, uh, but I always stuck around to uh, fight my way out of the hole and uh, uh, come back, and I think uh, it's important that you understand it's cyclical. Now let me tell you a little bit about Omega um, before getting into the investment outlook. I try, I'm trying in this uh, brief talk to touch on a number of different subjects uh, to see you know, what will interest you. The students, probably most interested in getting a job upon graduation. So we'll talk a little bit about philosophy and technique. Uh, to the corporations in the audience, you want to know what's going to happen in the economy, uh, maybe what's going to happen to interest rates. Uh, so I'm going to try to touch a little bit of everything and then let the Q&A to drill down to where you're most interested. So but I'll talk a little bit about what Mega does. We're an equity-oriented hedge fund uh, with a, what we call a macro capability. Macro is distinguished from equities, macro being you know, bonds, currency, commodities. Uh, so we have a little bit of an overlay. Uh, we manage about $6.6 .6 billion uh, in total. Uh, we have 40 individuals of the firm, about 14 of which are partners in the so-called incentive carry that we earn if we do well. We try to make money for our investors in five different ways. No one way is more important than the other way. Though I say the largest return has come from uh, the third element on the list. Uh, um, actually, we didn't have a slide on that. Uh, but uh, the five ways we make money are number one, basically is market direction. I don't care how smart you are, a rising tide lifts all the ships, a receding tide lowers all the ships, so we spent a lot of time at Omega, my partner Steve Einhorn is vice chairman of the firm, studying the economy, the Fed, market valuation, and trying to determine whether the stock market's undervalued going up or overvalued going down, because that determines our exposure to risk assets. Stocks and, uh, are higher risk assets than is cash and short-term bonds. And so if you think the market's going down, you want to be defensively postured. If you think the market's going up, you want to be reasonably fully invested. Number one. Number two, we do a lot of work in the area of asset allocation. We look at uh, stocks versus bonds, and within bonds, we would look at government bonds versus industrial bonds, high yield bonds, and structured corporate credit. Uh, and we're trying constantly, whether it's United States, Canada, or Western Europe, where we look at all these different markets, to try and find what I refer to as a straw hat in the winter. During the winter, people don't buy straw hats, they buy them in the summer. So it stands to reason if they're not buying something, it's out of favor, it it's could be potentially undervalued. So we're looking for the straw hats in the winter where we think something can change, buy them in the winter and hope by the summer they're more recognized. 
Third, where I spend the bulk of my own personal time is uh, undervalued stocks on the long side. We visit companies, we knock on doors, we quiz managements, we study industry statistics, uh, study valuation, and try to determine whether a stock is mispriced. We buy it uh, if we think it's undervalued, and with patient capital, we'll wait for the market to recognize what we think we recognize, stock to appreciate, and then move on to the next undervalued security. Fourthly, which distinguishes a hedge fund from a mutual fund is two things. An egregiously high fee structure. Most mutual funds manage for 1% or less, and hedge funds uh, charge a similar to larger fee and get a percentage of the ups. Um, and the other thing that distinguishes them is you can sell stocks short. And the best way to understand that is you sell something you don't own because you think it's overvalued, and you buy when it declines in price uh, and cover your short. So you can not only make money long, you can make money short, and you participate uh, with the investor in a share of the profits. And finally, uh, we do a certain amount of what I call macro investing, where we have, might have a view of interest rates, so we can go long or short of bonds, we can go long or short uh, commodity like oil. Oil is currently $100 a barrel. We developed this view, the global economy is slowing, oil is going to be in excess supply, we think the price could drop to 80, so we might short oil at 100, the idea of buying it at 80, we might buy it at 100 because we think it's going to 120. And we do a lot of supply demand work in, in that regard. And so it could be a currency, uh, it could be uh, commodities, it could be uh, bonds. Um, and so we try, this is what we try to do. Uh, for 20 years, uh, our returns have been 13.5%, uh, net of all fees to the investor, uh, which is approximately 550 basis points in excess of the S&P 500. And we've done that with an average net long position of about 70%. So we've been less than fully invested uh, and have achieved a return 550 basis points in excess of the market. Now it gets a little more difficult to talk about the investment outlook, which I think a chunk of the audience is more interested in. And I'm really kind of in a information uh, uh, because I've been very optimistic the last uh, two and a half years, but I'm beginning to become a bit less optimistic. Uh, uh, rather than uh, overwhelm me with the specific forecast, I'd like to show you my methodology because if some of the things I'm looking at don't resonate with you with some of the kind of analysis we're doing, again, I should tell you something about the right career path to, to pursue. But the, the great Warren Buffett once observed that forecasts of the future uh, tell you more about the forecast than they tell you about the future. So I think I've told you a bit about myself. What I did not mention uh, is that of the 6.6 billion that we manage, roughly a quarter of that is the capital of the partners of the firm. So Warren Buffett has popularized this notion, he eats his own cooking, uh, uh, we eat our own cooking because if we lose money, we're gonna lose more than anyone loses because of our investment. If we make more, we make more than anyone makes because of our investment. So in a, a sense, uh, we have a complete uh, alignment uh, of interest. We live in a very exciting times, but I have to say the message I'm giving people now, which is a little bit different than I've been giving the last two and a half years, I think, that the, I think that the stock market is in a zone of fair valuation, notwithstanding the large number of tail risks out there. And every forecast or market view uh, is based upon certain assumptions. So I'm gonna tell you what mine are, uh, then I'm gonna develop uh, my view with uh, more detail and more uh, uh, statistical substantiation. Uh, my first assumption is the economy continues to grow. Um, uh, albeit uh, at a slow subpar rate of about 2%, and that we don't fall into a recession in the next 12 months. That's very important because uh, most every recession I know of is preceded by a bear market. So if we don't have a recession, the likelihood of a bear market, I think, is small. Secondly, and this has taken a lot of brain power from a lot of people, uh, and that is that the ECB European Central Bank continues to act to stabilize the financial system in Europe, much the way our Fed uh, did so in the United States, and that these Eurozone governments, uh, particularly Germany, act in a cooperative way to fund weak uh, European sovereign debt needs. Uh, and uh, further, the European banks raise the costly capital they have to raise, shed troubled loans to opportunistic hedge funds like ourselves, and the ECB takes off troubled loans in the bank's balance sheets. 
They earn money with a positive slope yield curve, and that in conjunction with the passage of time, uh, the European financial institutions will earn their way out of the hole they're in. Uh, and uh, let me just say on uh, that score, uh, there have been two schools of thought the last two years on Europe. One school of thought is been, has been that the problem is so complex, so difficult to understand, that it exceeds one's bandwidth and they don't want to invest. Because they think the, con the consequences are so catastrophic. The second school of thought, uh, which I've pursued, was 45 years of investing, when everybody's teeth is gnashing, gnashing about a problem, and everybody believes something, if it hits, is so catastrophic in its impact, it generally doesn't hit. So uh, maybe it was an easy way out, but what I've been saying to myself is that the, the, the breakup of the euro and the eurozone is so catastrophic in its impact over Europe that the ECB, the IMF, which is 70% funded by the United States, Germany, France, China, uh, Japan, will all chip in to do what they have to do to kick the can down the road, uh, and we will not have a catastrophic outcome in uh, Europe. That is still my belief, and when people start to think more along those ways, you know, if you listen to what Germany is saying today versus what Germany was saying a year ago, it's totally different. Because Germany understands if the euro breaks apart, they're a major loser. Why? Because if the euro breaks apart and the Deutsche Mark starts trading as a separate currency, it'll go to a level like the Swiss franc where Germany will not be able to export anything competitively. So it's their interest to keep the uh, eurozone together. It's more complicated in the United States because in the United States we had one central bank. In Europe you have 17 members of the EU, each with their own kind of views, so it's more difficult to bring everybody together. And the third assumption I'm making, which I think is being challenged right now, is that China is in the midst of a soft landing not a hard landing, and that we'll have growth in real terms in China of somewhere between 6 and 7 percent. Um, and uh, it has to be watched uh, very, very carefully. Uh, the Chinese government, I think, is uh, in the early stages of significant easing. They cannot afford uh, a significant economic slowdown or recession because of the potential for social unrest in the country. The best way to think about the problem China faces is very simple. It's a nation of 800 million farmers that only needs 200 million farmers. And those 600 million people that leave the farm start to move into cities, and they have to have employment. And if they don't have employment, you can have social unrest. So the biggest challenge to the government there is to find tw uh, jobs for 25 million more people every year. And that's what they're working on. So uh, my uh, principal conclusions in the equity market are driven off of these observations and all my discussion that follows justifies these statements. No recession in the forecast horizon, monetary policy accommodative, valuation reasonable, investors have de-risked. Okay, and the conclusion I had, and I got quoted in this way on TV, uh, was stocks are the best house in the financial asset neighborhood. It's not clear whether it's a good or bad neighborhood, and I still believe that, by the way. So the first thing, let's talk a little bit about uh, the economy, because I think a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, and uh, Basically, as you can see from the middle column, the average economic expansion, uh, when one gets going, basically, is uh, lasts about uh, five years, 60 months. Now, I'm not here to debate whether this expansion is going to be longer or shorter than average, but if I had to debate that, I would argue that it might likely be longer than average because there's so many sectors of the economy are still operating below potential given the severity of the recession of 08. So autos are just starting to come back, uh, still, I think, below treaded demand. Housing is way depressed, way below a normalized demand. Uh, retail sales, still uh, below normalized demand. So uh, I think, as I said before, most recessions are preceded by bear markets. If we're right, they were about a little bit past the midpoint of this economic expansion, it's not logical to expect a significant market decline. Um, the reasons for our, our, our relative optimism in the economy are in this slide. Uh, you know, we're, all, we're unhappy that employment is not growing four or 500,000 a month, but we should understand it is still growing. It's growing subpar, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of reasons we can discuss later, but em employment is improving and the average monthly increase has been somewhere around 140 to 150,000. Uh, there's still pent-up demand in the consumer sector. The consumer's balance sheet has been improving as they've pursued conservative financial policies. 
residential investment is way below trend. You know, housing starts are way below normalized demand. And I won't read every one of these uh, uh, factors, but uh, I think um, these are our reasons why we stand before you, I stand before you, expecting uh, uh, economic growth uh, uh, to continue. Uh, our economic framework is on uh, this exhibit. Uh, we're expecting something between two and two and a half percent growth. Um, and uh, basically, um, it's not ebullient. It's not a feel-good environment. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, it's an environment of uh, growth. The reason uh, I say it's not a feel-good environment, and you should understand these statistics, in the US economy, typically, the labor force, the number of people seeking employment, grows about 1% a year. The productivity of the labor force grows about 2% a year. So you need around 3% growth in real terms to make a dent or even to keep unemployment level. And we're not growing at that rate. We're growing at a very sluggish subpar rate. Uh, you can argue for the different reasons, the need for uh, governments to delever and get their house in order given the size of a budget deficit, the uncertainty that exists in America over the fiscal cliff and uh, the tax regime and uh, perhaps uh, anti-business policies uh, being practiced by some. We're not going to go there too aggressively. Um, and so, um, you know, whatever the case may be, the economy is growing, but it's not a feel-good economy uh, because the growth is not rapid enough to reduce the level of unemployment in the economy. Um, giving you some support, a very important area of the economy to both the consumer and consumer psychology is housing, and you see the, really the ingredients for a decent sized recovery in housing activity. Affordability is near record high, that's the top left hand slide. Uh, uh, home prices to disposable income is running near uh, record low levels, uh, uh, so houses are cheap. In fact, the value of a home is a function of the capitalized cost of renting. Uh, rents have gone up uh, much more relative to house prices, and so now it's actually cheaper to buy a home than to rent. <clears throat> but people have not been doing it aggressively yet because one of the most important expenditures they make in their lifetime is a home purchase. And to the extent that they're not confident that the home prices have bottomed out, they don't want to make that uh, jump, that leap. But as they start to see evidence of house prices bottoming out, and in certain areas you're back, you're back into bidding contests, uh, they'll be more optimistic. So home ownership has declined to uh, very low levels. Rent as a percentage of the mortgage payment is uh, at a record high. Again, it's cheaper to now to buy than to uh, rent. Uh, and you can see uh, existing uh, home prices are starting to rise. Uh, builder uh, confidence is rising. Uh, and uh, housing inventory has come down over the last uh, few years, and a lot of uh, sectors of the economy, all this excess inventory has been absorbed. So the conditions are right for housing. I think that's an important underpinning to the economy. The second area worth talking about is uh, the Fed. Um, and when Mary and I came to Wall Street 45 years ago, there was a very trite but very correct statement, and that was the central bank or the Federal Reserve Board wrote the market letter for Wall Street. When the Fed was tightening, it was restrictive, negative for the market. When the Fed was easy, it was positive. Well, it's just not the US Fed, but the central banks all over the world are telling you they want more growth, are willing to risk more inflation, uh, they want more employment, and they're driving interest rates down to uh, relatively non-competitive levels. So here you look at money supply growth exploded over the last couple of years. The Federal Reserve balance sheet uh, has exploded as they've taken uh, loans onto their books off the banks to give the banks uh, more ability to lend uh, to the private sector. And we're dealing with a federal funds rate that has been zero now for a couple of years. And just recently, uh, uh, Fed Chairman Bernanke spoke and uh, held out the prospect that uh, interest rates will remain in the short end uh, zero for a couple more years. Then you look around the world. This is the ECB balance sheet. The ECB balance sheet is a percentage of the GDP. Bank of Japan balance sheet. Bank of Japan balance sheet is a percentage of GDP. Bank of England balance sheet and is a percentage of GDP. And the message is all the same. Uh, there's been 250 easings by central banks all over the world, and my guess is uh, China is in the very early stages of their easing. And uh, that's got to be viewed positively. Another common sense way of explaining it, I may say this later, and I'll try to remember not to repeat myself, but basically all of us in this audience to varying degrees have a challenge of investing our financial assets. Some have little, you go to school, you're getting an education. Some have more than a little. But what are your choices today? Your choices are basically cash, which is zero. 
U.S. government bonds, which I'll discuss in a little while, is about one and a half, 1.6 percent. Hardly a positive return after taxes and a negative return after inflation. It can be high yield bonds. I'll show you in a little while that they've dramatically been re repriced. Or there's common stocks. And as we go through each of these alternatives in the next few minutes, you'll see why I say the stocks are the best house in the financial asset neighborhood. Okay. Now, very, very important to any value investor is where you're getting into the market. Because you could be very right on your stock pick, but wrong on your entry point and not make any money. So I try to give you where we are today in the market versus an historical perspective. So for the last 50 years ended uh, 2010, the S&P multiple averaged about, uh, call it 15 times, 14.9. And um, in that period of time when the S&P multiple averaged 14.9, the 10-year U.S. government bond, the comment to the right, averaged 6.67%. Well, here we are, the market's about 13 and a half times the estimate of earnings, roughly 10% below its long-term average, but the U.S. government bond at 1.6% is almost a quarter of its long-term average. So P.E. ratios relative to interest rates are quite low, extraordinarily low. When the inflation rate in the country ranged between 1 and 3%, the multiple in the S&P was actually close to 17. So I look at this exhibit against a span of time, stocks are cheap against their history, they're cheap, very cheap against interest rates, and they're very cheap against inflation. And I think the stock market is suggesting, and it's probably a good suggestion, that we're probably going to be looking at higher interest rates over the next few years and slower economic growth versus history. But to the extent that's being discounted, that's a plus for the market because you're buying into something that already discounts a conservative set of assumptions. Now, I'll give you a, a parallel. In the year 2000, the last bubble that was in technology stocks. In 2000, Cisco was selling at 100 times the analyst estimate of earnings. Okay? It had no dividends, so the yield was zero. And U.S. government bond rates were 6.5%. Fast forward 12 years, today, Cisco is 10 times the estimate of analyst earnings, down from 100 times. The stock yields 3% versus zero. And 10-year governments are 1.6 down from 6.5. So you can now buy Cisco, which is a growing corporation, you can debate the growth rate, that yields twice what 10-year government bonds are yielding, okay? And uh, a multiple that's one-tenth of what it was 12 years ago. So uh, valuation looks appealing. Secondly, I don't believe the returns will be as ebullient going forward as this uh, historical numbers have suggested. But whenever you're bought into the stock market in the range of 12 to 14 times earnings where you are now, the return one year later was about 15%. Three years later, average 16% per annum. And five years later, average 15%. So we're, we're, we're buying in a historical context where returns prospectively are very attractive. For reasons I'll discuss later, there's always a dark side to everything. I don't think the returns will be nearly as attractive as they've been historically going forward. Now, I mentioned about stocks being the best house in the financial asset neighborhood. I find this chart very interesting. At Omega, we made a great deal of money in 2010, 2011, and partially this year in the high yield bond market. If you look at this Bloomberg chart, in November of 2008, it was a once, I think, in a lifetime, I hope, because the suffering and the pain you go through in those periods are so dramatic, you don't want to live through it again. But I certainly would say safely, it was once in a generation opportunity in high yield. The high yield mark was 25%. You could buy senior securities in the capital structure of the company yielding 25%. The 100-year return in the equity market was 10%. So you were buying a senior security that was yielding two and a half times what the long-term return in the equity market has been. Well, if you look at the bottom uh, footnote, uh, uh, I guess I had this pointer I could be using. Uh, Got to find where it gets on the screen. Here it is, right there. Th when the uh, high yield index was 25 percent, the S&P multiple was 13.9. The high yield index is now sub 7 percent, and the multiple in the market is not materially different than it was in 2008. Now we're getting towards cyclical peak earnings versus trough earnings, but nonetheless. The, long, the, the high yield bond is about a quarter of its uh, peak, yet the multiple in the market is not substantially different than when high yield was four times greater. And anyone who follows the high yield market will tell you credit spreads are historically very tight and yields are historically very, very low. So that once in a generation opportunity is gone. Then here, Mary and I always had a favorite professor that shaped and uh, uh, nurtured our interest in security analysis. His name was Professor Roger Murray. 
at Columbia, and I can remember like it yesterday, unfortunately it wasn't yesterday, about 45 years ago, we told the class 1958 was a famous year in the equity market. And he then went on to explain, 1958 was the year of the yield reversal. Prior to 1958, stocks yielded more than bonds. You were coming out of World War II, there was a great fear of a uh, post-World uh, War uh, recession, depression, letdown, and uh, then beginning in 1958, when people saw the economy growing and companies growing and Sears Roebuck was opening up a store in the suburbs virtually every week, the market bought into the concept of total return, meaning the investors bought into the concept of total return. They said the return of stock is not just a dividend, but it's a dividend coupled with the growth in the dividend. Well, we've turned back over 50 years of history. But as you can see from this uh, chart, um, when I put this together, over half the stocks in the S&P 500 now yield more than bonds. Now, admittedly, government bonds are artificially depressed by the Fed's you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, policies, but this is higher than it was in 2008, which was an important market bottom in 45%. And you look back over the years, nothing like we are now. So you can find many, 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 many stocks, and I hope your investment club that's uh, managing Mario's money, uh, which he knows will never get back, uh, or the other money in the university, and your investment club activities, that you're seeing many, many stocks that are yielding substantially in excess of, uh, of uh, bonds, and these are uh, growing companies. Now, I, have a, I was probably um, somewhat uh, uh, inappropriately quoted, and I should elaborate, I was correctly quoted, but probably an inappropriate statement, but I made a comment uh, about uh, six months ago on TV that I wouldn't be caught dead owning a U.S. government bond. And uh, that's kind of an out, you know, it's not an outlandish statement, it's a correct statement, by the way, but you know, too strong. Uh, what I meant by that is not that I question the U.S. government's ability to pay us back, they'll be fine, they'll pay you back, but the, you're just not being compensated for the risk. So I felt incumbent upon me to explain my position. And historically, if you look at the 10-year U.S. government bond, it's yielded in line with nominal GDP. Nominal GDP is the summation of real growth and inflation. So if you say to yourself that the world we live in would be something like 2 to 3 percent real growth and 2 to 3 percent inflation, that means nominal or top-line GDP, which is the same thing looking at a company's sales, and that we're growing somewhere between 4 and 6 percent per annum. Keep in mind that 4 percent, we're not going to absorb uh, more uh, unemployed people. So there will be social policy will be tilted towards trying to generate more economic growth. Well, if history repeats itself and the 10-year government bond goes back to where nominal GDP is, that means in a few years' time when we get out of this soup in the economy that the 10-year government bond will be 4 or 5 or 6 percent. Well, this is bond arithmetic. I printed this to get it up here in time when the 10-year was 1.5 percent. I think it's now about 1.7. But if we go from 1.5 to 4 in three years, including your coupon, you've lost 11% of your money. If it goes from one and a half to five, you've lost 16% of your money. If it goes from one and a half to six, it goes to 21% of your money. Now, the maximum marginal tax rate is uh, 35%. So if you buy a bond at one and a half percent, you keep 65%, leaving out state taxes for the moment, you really get an after tax return of about 1%. Um, doesn't wash. I, don't, I think your capital is being confiscated, so I have no particular interest um, in uh, government bonds as an alternative to common stocks. Now, the last area I want to mention um, is, it, it kind of comes in the world of contrary opinion. You know, uh, uh, it's an expression that which those of you that come to Wall Street will come to respect and understand, uh, uh, and that is the stock market does whatever it's got to do to confound the largest group of investors. I mean, when everybody's complacent and comfortable in their forecasts, the guys like me, the market does something that surprised you. Well, in the last five years, we've seen a significant de-risking by the public and by institutions of their equity ownership. So what would the pain trade be? The surprise would be as it happened this year. The market goes up because everybody is expecting the market to go down. So you look here and you see, again, every year in the last five years, significant selling of equity funds by the public. What are they doing? They're buying bond funds. Even though the market's up about 14 to 15% this year, what are they doing? They're continuing to liquidate. Then you look at uh, uh, the pension fund sector. 
Pension funds have gone from 60% equities to near 50. Most of them have actuarial assumptions on their pension plan of earning 7 or 8% a year. You can't do it in fixed income, in my opinion. It's either going to be uh, real estate, private equity, uh, or uh, equities. Um, and then you look here at the public. They've gone from 29% of their financial assets and equities down to around 20 and their holding of uh, stock funds have declined, and the holding of bond funds have risen. So I, I say the pain trade uh, to the public is if the market went up and, uh, um, you know, uh, not, not uh, going down. Um, now, I don't want to stand here in front of you and uh, appear like the village idiot, uh, uh, because I'm not. Uh, the economy faces a significant number uh, of issues that we have to deal with. Um, and uh, one is the so-called fiscal cliff. Uh, if nothing happens, there's legislative tax increases and expenditure cuts that hit the economy Jan 1 of $576 billion, which is a little bit less than 4% of GDP. Now, if we continue to have gridlock in government, resulting from the fact that Republicans and Democrats can't stand each other, they don't want to talk to each other, they don't negotiate, uh, uh, we could have a serious setback. I refuse to believe that they're that dumb. You know, uh, at the end of the day, it's the same group that didn't like each other in 2008, but they did what they had to do in terms of legislation to get the economy out of this uh, sharp dive. So I think rather than push us into a, a, a dramatic recession, uh, that there'll be compromises, but it's uh, not 100% uh, clear that it's going to happen. So I think that's something that we have to kind of uh, think about and worry about. Uh, I have a firm view about the coming election. We can talk about that later in Q&A, but that's just a personal opinion. It's about like talking about abortion, I guess. Uh, a lot of uh, people with different opinions. Second, I'm very concerned about the uh, huge buildup of federal debt. Just common sense kind of observation. The nation was founded in 1776. We had no debt. We now have 16 trillion of federal debt. So we went from 1776 to 2012 to go from zero to 16 trillion. That's going up by over a trillion dollars a year now. It's unsustainable. We have to deal with this. This president commissioned Simpson Bowles, they came up with some credible ideas, but we've done nothing with them. But I think unless we move in this area, I think it's gonna be a significant issue. And uh, while we're not Greece, we could have similar type problems, not to the same degree, if we don't start dealing with our problems, as you can see what's happening to our debt relative to the size of our economy. Uh, and I think that's a, a problem. And lastly, um, there's you know, huge legislative tax increases on the horizon, uh, not particularly friendly towards capital formation. Uh, the current uh, top tax rate on dividends are 15 percent. Uh, I guess you can see the uh, right there, 15. If uh, Obama uh, has his way, it's almost a tripling of the dividend tax increase. I don't think it's going to happen. And there's going to be about uh, nine point or uh, 50 percent or so increase in the tax rate and capital gains. And you know, if you lower the after-tax return on investing, you're basically going to lower the amount of investment that's taking place. So we have to resolve these issues, uh, which uh, basically uh, confront us. And um, probably nothing's going to happen until November 6th, and we see who the leader of the country is and who controls Congress. So these are factors we have to worry about. Now, uh, my uh, observation was uh, to go back early into my career. Um, my Horatio Alder story, I say this with a big smile and a certain sense of modesty, but I got my MBA from Columbia on January 31st of 1967. Uh, I had a child while I was at business school who was six months old when I graduated. Um, I had no money in the bank and I had a National Defense Education Act student loan to repay. So those of you in the Gabelli School of Business, I'm sure that you've learned that if you have an LL liability and no assets, you have a negative net worth. Okay, I hope you learned that. And basically, I had no choice but to go to work immediately. So the very next day, February 1st of 1967, I started my close to 25 year career at Goldman Sachs. Well, on February 1st of uh, 1967, the Dow was roughly 850. And lo and behold, 15 years later, it was 850. And I made my money by finding things that were very cheap, so that were at 700 in the Dow, or the equivalent, and uh, grinding it out, even though the overall mark was going nowhere. And I can very well uh, appreciate a scenario where, uh, because of the need of governments around the world to delever 
and to get their financial house in order that the next few years we could remain in a choppy environment as we deal with the fiscal cliff, as we deal with the uh, huge deficit issues and uh, the market sees a need to deal with them in an intelligent fashion. So I'm prepared, you know, it's harder for me. You, you folks are young, you know, we're in early 20s, late teens, whatever, that uh, you can live through another three years of this. As I said at the beginning, you know, my life expected 82. I mean, another three years of nothing kind of market is gonna be very painful to me, but I'm gonna do it. Uh, I'm gonna work at it because this is what I love doing. This is what uh, I have an obligation to do because I took somebody's money. I gotta uh, manage it uh, intelligently and properly. Now, I am a value investor, and somebody over lunch asked, what does a value investor mean? And what it means to me is I want more for less. So when you look at the stock market, basically, the S&P 500 is an index of 500 companies. On average, it grows about 5% per annum. On average, it's yielding about 2%. It sells a little over two times the book value of the 500 companies in the index. It has debt about 35% of its capital, that's debt to equity plus debt, okay? It returns on equity currently is about 16%. Normally, it's closer to 14 to 15. Uh, and the P-E ratio for that statistical uh, millage uh, is 13 and a half times. So as a value investor, I'm looking for companies that are growing more rapidly, that sell at a lower multiple, or have more dividend yield than the market at a lower valuation, or maybe give me a lot more asset value versus the value that I'm paying for it. And that's, to me, what a value investor is all about. So you could be a value investor and buy Apple Computer. Apple's sitting $120 billion in cash. It sells at 12 and a half times earnings. It earns 50% in equity, and all the equity is excess capital on the balance sheet. But if you have a view about growth, I think growth won't be like it's been the last few years, but I think they'll grow 20% a year in the next few years. So it's growing four times the market, selling at a slightly lower than market multiple. You have to accept technology risk. Don't forget, you know, three years ago, we were standing here, we'd be talking about wearing out our thumbs on the uh, BlackBerry. And uh, now BlackBerry subscriber base in the United States of America is dropping at a rate of 50% per annum. They've been knocked out. I joined Xerox out of uh, uh, Hunter College, my first job, uh, basically. Uh, it was all about American photocopy. And you don't hear about them anymore. Xerography knocked them out. You know, in the world of technology, somebody's innovation and somebody's obsolescence. So you have to make that judgment call. But this is what a value investor does. It looks for more, for less. Now, I, I said at the outset that um, I was becoming a, a little bit less sanguine. You know, and sometimes you're, you know, you're in the midst of a changing a view, adjusting a view, and you're speaking at the wrong time. You need a little more time to think things through. But basically, um, firstly, the market now at this level that it got to after the result of last week's rally is about 13 and a half times earnings. That has been the upper end of the PE range in the market for the last three years. So it's at the upper end of the range of the last three years. Secondly, the third quarter this year, now I'm giving you a little bit more short-term view, the third quarter this year will be the first down quarter year over year since the, th the third quarter of 2009. So the rate of increase in corporate profits is ameliorating and actually could very well be down uh, for a while, uh, and that's a factor. And as we get closer and closer to the end of the year, the fiscal cliff issues start to loom uh, larger. And I think uh, there's huge uncertainty regarding tax policy that I mentioned before. And I first to admit that uh, China is slowing uh, more than expected. This has to be watched very, very carefully. And finally, the ECB, while they've taken important steps, there's a lot more things they have to do regarding fiscal integration, uh, bank sector uh, union, and stuff like that. So I think we... Uh, you know, we, I think we've adjusted ourselves now to a level of fair valuation. So I'd say, personally, I think the market's got 5% up, 10% down. But, you know, I intend to follow the advice of Arthur Burns. He was a professor uh, teaching PhDs at Columbia. Uh, and one of his students, upon graduation, went to the professor and said, Professor Burns, do you have any advice to me now that I'm graduating? And his advice was, forecast well, but above all, forecast often. So uh, uh, right now, I'd say, uh, Stocks are the best house in the financial asset neighborhood. I try to develop the reasoning why. Uh, I think near term, uh, as much risk in the market as reward. But I do believe that uh, properly selected by Gabelli, or maybe even Cooperman, uh, we can make money for you in the market that we see. But I hope I touched on things that interest you. Uh, if I was an industrialist in the audience, I'd lock in long-term money. 
uh, if I had access to public markets, because I think interest rates are at uh, generation lows. They don't belong here when I look at the fiscal condition of the country. Um, and I would plan on the U.S. economy continue to grow at a modest pace. And if I was a student getting ready to go out uh, to pursue my career, is just get the, the best education you can, get the best grades you can, uh, give back through community service, try to distinguish your resume from the next person because you're in a very competitive environment and uh, you just want to strengthen your credentials to every extent you can. And I'm going to stop here and then take it, questions. Uh, we have time for only a couple of questions because Mr. Cooperman has to be on his way to TF Green. And if he doesn't get out of here in about five minutes, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have to I drive him long? to New Jersey. So um, no, you know, I, I don't want to do that. So uh, I think uh, we have a Is this the jury or who are these guys? We, we, that's the jury. <laughs> so we have a question guilty, for the jury. Uh, and we also have mics. But, uh, <laughs> All right. My name is Dan Waltz. I'm a student fund manager here at Roger Williams. Mr. Cooper, my first question. Um, you put a lot of reliance towards fundamental analysis when valuing out the intrinsic value of companies and then base that off of the fair market value. What are some of the key indicators that you base those decisions off of and how much reliance do you put towards behavioral analysis? I put a lot of reliance on my behavior, but uh, no, I'm, I'm very analytical. Uh, I'll try, my team derives models, revenues, costs, earnings, growth rates, market position, growth in the market, so on and so forth. And we have a certain view of what the uh, growth rate is worth. And uh, if it's selling, you know, Graham and Dodd hypothesized in the book Security Analysis that every security had a ban of intrinsic value. And the job of the security analyst, uh, analyst, uh, ana analyst is to recommend securities that are basically selling below that ban of intrinsic value, which is the result of growth rates, returns, cash flow generation. The most important thing to me is free cash flow. Because unless the company is generating free cash flow, there's nothing, they have no luxury of pursuing other alternatives. So with that free cash flow, they can invest in their business, they can buy back equity, they can pay dividends. That's the elixir that keeps things going. So I say free cash flow, most important to me in a good industry with honest management, honest management. I would not knowingly invest with somebody who was dishonest, now, I've invested knowingly with uh, incompetent people because something was just too cheap to ignore. But more often than not, you know, there's something in that expression, if you go to bed with dogs, you wake up with fleas. But I'm, uh, I'm a little bit like Warren Buffett, except about a lot less zeros, in the sense that, uh, you know, he, he believes in investing with a well-run company. In fact, his favorite expression was, he likes to invest in companies that become managed by an idiot, because sooner or later an idiot will be running them. So uh, that's what he said, and that's pretty humorous, but nobody caught that one. But anyway, uh, I'd like to invest in businesses that are cash flow generators, uh, that are run by capable management, where the management is properly incentivized to do the heavy lifting, and I benefit from uh, their hard work. So the best case in point, a uh, fellow named Sandy Gottesman, a terrific guy, runs First Manhattan. Uh, he was an investor with uh, Berkshire Hathaway for, I don't know, 50 years. He moved out of the partnership when Warren unwound his partnership and uh, kept his investment in Berkshire Hathaway. I think he's worth three or four billion dollars and having all the heavy lifting done by Warren. That's the, the, the essence of investing, find a well-run company uh, and back the jockey, make sure he's properly compensated and uh, benefit from his performance or her performance. Another question behind you. No, one more, this is the last question. I apologize if I went over because I'm, I'm more than happy to take as many it's your questions. Plane, but, uh, you're, you're the no, no, I, 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 got four, I, I can't be late. Final question. I'm Mike Densmore. I'm also a uh, student fund manager. Uh, I was wondering during your experience in investing in China, how did you get around issues? of uh, company uh, transparency. Got a different question. I, I have no investments in China. Right. I have, I have, excuse me, I dropped something and I want to litter up the floor here. Uh, I have one investment in Asia. I, I own AIA, the uh, Asian insurance company, which is growing uh, quite rapidly. Used to be controlled by uh, AIG, but in their financial problems, they uh, spun it out to the public. So it's a rapidly growing company at a very attractive valuation. But I'm not a big investor in China. There are enough companies in America, Western Europe, Canada, that uh, uh, I'm not as global as some other people. After leaving Goldman, why did you go off and start Omega instead of uh, taking a more traditional route, working for the Treasury or another government agency? 
I don't know if that's traditional, basically. I would still be at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I had a lot of uh, vim and vigor in me. Uh, I retired from Goldman for one reason. Uh, I spent my first 23 years of the firm uh, being part of or running the research department. Then the firm came to me in uh, 1989. Uh, I had been agitating the prior five or six years telling Goldman management that they were making a mistake not being in the money management business. And so they came to me in 1989 and said, you know, you were right, we were wrong. Would you build us an asset management business? And so I left research to start Goldman Sachs Asset Management. I was chairman and CEO. But after a relatively short period of time, I saw that the firm's objectives and my objectives didn't mesh. And this is not being critical of Goldman. I had 25 glorious years there. It's a great firm. But uh, Goldman understood assets and the management times fee equal revenue. So they wanted to manage as much money as they can humanly get their hands on because that would grow the business. And my objective was very different. I wanted to co-invest with the investors, have my money alongside of them, and manage a rational sum of money where I can deliver good returns. So after a year of doing what Goldman wanted me to do, I saw that they wanted me on the road making marketing presentations, gathering a lot of assets, starting new product lines. You know, Goldman, you know, I started the first mutual fund at Goldman Sachs since the Depression called the uh, GS Capital Growth Fund. They wouldn't put their name on it because John Weinberg, uh, who's passed away, uh, his father saved the firm during the Great Depression. If you read chapter two, John again, Kenneth Galbraith's book in, in, uh, The Great Crash, he says, in Goldman Sachs, we trust. Goldman came out with some mutual funds right at the top uh, of 1929. They went to near zero. And he did not want Goldman to be in the mutual fund business. Now, if you open up the Wall Street Journal, you'll see 40 or 50 uh, different funds that Goldman Sachs is selling to the public. So I wanted to be in a different kind of business. So I retired. I'm proud to say I managed $400 million for Goldman Sachs. Now, uh, Willie Sutton said, he asked him why he robbed the banks. He said, that's where the money is. So if your choice was going into the money management business where you mass somebody's money for 1%, or you could have some variation of 1% or 2% and 20%, and you want to be more entrepreneurial, and you want your money right with the investors, you know, uh, uh, the hedge fund business was a more logical route for me. I don't know if that answers your question. Again, I apologize if it went too long. I wanted to cover a broad range of subjects. If I could be of help to any of you, as long as it's not between 9.30 and 4, you can feel free to reach out, get this presentation, and I'd like to impart whatever wisdom. I sit on the board, as Mario does, of Columbia Business School, and we like to work with young people and try to give them career guidance and help out. And I'm sure, you know, Buffett recently visited the business school, and everybody was kind of depressed about what's going on in the environment. He said, uh, if you have a Columbia MBA, and I'll say the same for you, that he said, he'd give you $100,000 now for 10% of your lifetime earnings. So I'm sure all you're going to be very successful, and uh, I'll take 10% of your lifetime earnings. On behalf of the faculty, staff, administration of Roger Williams University, thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Thank you so much.